Eric uh, Cheng, wow, seven years, right? Um, look, I'm going to start at the, f at the fact that on your website, you're very honest with your background. Um, your copywriters and you must have had a long and honest chat, and you're very open with your early beginnings, right? So on your website, your About Us page, it mentions very honestly that you are a college dropout, and uh, you're also very honest about saying that your nickname in school was David Copperfield because of the disappearing act from school. But then here you are, and you run now um, what is essentially Malaysia's soon-to-be most valuable listed tech company um, ever known in the history of the country. So I want to get into your head. How, how does a guy who once uh, was known as David Copperfield become who you are now? Oh, that, I think firstly, thanks for the introduction, uh, <laughs> especially Alan as well. Uh, and um, I, I think it, it wasn't really, um, I think one thing could kind of just sum it up all of the journey right, that I've been through, uh, but it was multiple things that kind of come together. Um, but to really define it maybe with you know, one sentence or one word, um, I think it, cause it got to do a lot of with the determination. Um, Especially during my younger days, I was always living in the shadow of my sister. Uh, she's always like the person who scored like, you know, straight A's, uh, STPM, appear in the newspaper, top 0.1% of the, 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 uh, the mark, the results probably. And I was the other guy who, you know, just probably doing one or two A <laughs> out of the PMR, SPM, art stream, you know, not, just not doing so well, right? And, and probably I spent a lot more time playing games, that's why I end up, you know, uh, uh, David Copperfield as my nickname in my yearbook. Um, but I think uh, at the end of the day, there was a very clear uh, directions or idea where I want to be. Um, I want to really to get out and start um, uh, making great things in my career. I had to start somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, really very much about like why I dropped out from college is, is I was studying accounting, and uh, after like about one or two years in it, I just kind of couldn't find myself uh, becoming, or I didn't see myself becoming an accountant like 10 plus year later, right? So, so then I, I, I made the decision to quit, uh, but that also triggered me to really think about what I want to do in my uh, career, right? Um, and very quickly, I started uh, my job in a first company um, and kind of, sort of, kind of just learned everything from there. Um, and eventually got to where I am. So this is a very short, condensed version, I would say. Uh, but in between, there's just so many things happens, right? That if you kind of just want to really think back and 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 ask yourself why that happened, um, I think it just comes down to the persistency, the determinations, how I really want to pursue a goal and seek that fulfillment, right? And I think uh, getting to where we are today, um, myself, even for the company. Um, I think there's still a lot more things that we can do, a lot more chapters that we can write, uh, and it's just still feel very much at the beginning, which is something really exciting, of course. Yeah, yeah, because it was in those years that you built what Robert Kwok has described in his book as you're building your scales, building your armor. You started a mail order magazine, I think, a newsletter which failed. Then you got some success early with World of Warcraft. I think you had some some early some early success there, but then you made a lot of money, I think, and then you lost that money. And then you talk on your website about how you were actually quite depressed and you didn't want to come out because after a few years, some of your college buddies had gotten jobs, they're making good money, and here you are having run two failed ventures. You know, it was quite demoralizing at the time, but it was in the, during those years that you learned about resilience, you learned about determination, and you learned how to build you know, your suits of armor, like plural, right? Can you talk about those years? Yeah, sure. So pretty much everything that I touched before Kassem um, failed miserably. So it was, <laughs> it, was uh, it was a good lesson, to be honest. It was a really good experience. Um, I think it kind of shaped the way I think about um, how I built Kassem eventually. Um, um, up, like, because of my upbringing, because I always living in the shadow of my sister and perhaps also because I was dropping out, starting career uh, like much earlier than everyone else. But you, you see that most people get a step in front, right? Where they graduate and get a really good, good, good uh, first job and eventually uh, you know, get even further, right, in the earlier years. And I, I think, think to myself, and I really want to 
be able to catch up. Um, and I think that catch up eventually turned into um, really want to take a shortcut to build stuff and get to the point that I can be on level playing ground with the rest and probably exceeding that right eventually. Uh, so that that's why those things happen, right? Like a uh, digital uh, uh, network, uh, mobile games, uh, World of Warcraft, and so on. Yeah. Always trying to seek for something to do uh, that can help me to really, um, you know, bring up the pace, right? Uh, and 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 I think. That was something that I did, um, and eventually when I failed, I realized that it's not the right way to do it. And I, I think every single part of that kind of taught me a lesson, um, how to really build a business. Um, and then when it comes to Carlson, I think that whole, the whole picture coming together, what is required for you to really build a really good business, um, and continue to really execute and keep doing it right, and get to a point to it can be called successful. Um, and I think that was there was a lot of those learnings when I when I captured right when I was doing the mobile game because I like games. When I was doing the ad network because I just thought that I know ad network very well. Uh, and of course, the world of Warcraft is kind of just really not not something that is sustainable. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So the fact that Afzal Abdul Rahim, I mean, he's very respected. Time.com, amazing guy. He, if he calls you the best executor he's ever seen, executor of business, not of people, um, that, that's a big deal, right? So can you talk through that? How, how did you become such an amazing execu executor? Assuming Afzal is not, you know, <laughs> but he, I'm sure he is. Yeah, I think mean, first of all, you should sure Afzal say that. <laughs> um, you know, really thanks for the compliment. Um, Again, right? I, 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 yes, I pro probably I emphasize execution a lot during my conversations with a lot of people, and that's how our business is, why our business is successful. Um, it's not an easy business to business model to execute. Uh, ultimately, there's a lot of uh, um, um, executions or operations uh, involved, right, in order to really get to somewhere. Um, and you need to be deep in the business to really know what's going on before you can. Uh, really craft out a, a strategy that is on point. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people, there could be a, some of them from the, of my, my company is watching this virtually. Uh, you know, kudos to all of them, to be honest. I think the best executor lies in the, the company, right, of Carson, uh, the team that we have built. Um, w we share one single goal, one common goal, in terms of how we think about building the business. So with that mission, uh, we turn it into uh, um, a, a product, right, or a service that we will make our customer better off. And from there, we think backward and see how we can execute to the point that we deliver the kind of product promise, uh, um, the kind of uh, offline infrastructures, the network to support uh, the kind of uh, um, frictionless uh, transaction environment, whether you're buying a car, selling a car with custom. Uh, I think that comes into our mind every now and then, that the end goal is to really work backwards towards how you think uh, customers would use our product and feel better off. Um, and it's especially resonated very well in the used car uh, market, right? That environment is something that is very low trust, lack transparency. Um, I think when we think about the pain points that people are facing, we just think about the solutions. And we think about solutions, then you come uh, with the, uh, uh, um, the scenarios, right, that you're trying to map to really get to a point uh, that this can be scalable and then you start really working on scaling and optimizing everything in between. So I think that is why you know, execution is something that uh, people can relate, right? Uh, why we are always like, executing very well. I think we just look into the details every day and night uh, to really make sure that we can get there as a team. But how did you come to that point? Because you had a couple of failures, and then you also spent eight years in Inity. Inity is your... So a lot of people don't realize that you have spent a lot of time as a salaried employee before you had some taste of success with Carson, right? So can you talk about what were some of the lessons that you learned in those early years that, that allowed you to make those informed judgments when it came to building Carson? I mean, we met 2015, so you really had all that 10, 12 years behind you when you started Carson before even 2015. Yeah, yeah, so many of you do not know, my first interview that was done <clears throat> publicly was with uh, uh, Mr. Ku over here, so you know he, he he grilled me in breakfast grill, which is you know <laughs> yeah I don't even want to you know, do another interview after that anymore. <laughs> but here I am today. Uh, I think yes, uh, 
it, it's really a lot of uh, mistakes, right, uh, and failures. Uh, then it kind of taught me that um, essentially building a business, you can have a really good market that you're operating, very obvious opportunity, a pain point that people see that you know dying for you to solve it. And then you have a, a team of people who could really help you to execute, and then you guys work together to deliver it. But um, I think at the end of the day, business from zero to one is, is, is the most important part, right? Before you get to one to 100 and start scaling and so on. And that zero to one uh, phase, you need to start with the foundation. And I think in Carson, we emphasize a lot on really understanding exactly what you're trying to do before you, uh, you know, build up, you know, you can go ahead and build up your competitive advantage, your unique strength, um, and continue to use that to amplify uh, the growth. Because if your team is running badly, you're running a bad solution, a product that people don't like it, no matter how you amplify it, it will be, you know, it will get even worse. It won't deliver results. Um, and I think we identify very early on what, what are the kind of foundations, right? And this relates back to you know, why I failed in the last couple of ventures, because a lot of those things you just think really far, um, but you want to get there as quickly as possible. You take shortcuts, but you just don't really spend time in the details. You don't spend time in really understanding what actually works, right? And test out different scenarios and so on, which we do that a lot in our company. I think, take for example, the last two years, we are all in COVID. Like, it's almost impossible that we do a physical event like this, right? Last, two, last 24 months. Um, but, you know, for us, we have grown, outgrown basically everyone within the market. Uh, we became one of the best performing also uh, regionally, regionally and globally. Uh, um, I think that comes down to the, uh, the, the op strategy that we observe, right, that we should deploy during the first lockdown. And we think that there's an opportunity for us. We, we should really prepare ourselves uh, train the people who are not able to get to work, but at the same time, whoever that's able to continue work remotely, how do we plan ahead as soon as lockdown is removed, we will be the first out of the gate. Because the 100 meter sprint, sprinting line is reset. Everyone starts from ground zero, right? So how quickly you get to the, the 100 meter now is really up to what you're gonna do right now. So, and, and that became the, the kind of talking points, right? Discussion topics and all. Uh, how do we move forward? Um, and we keep thinking ahead. So, and as soon as uh, you know the uh, we the lockdown is is, uh, we uh, started to you know back go back to office and start working, start operating. Um, you see that flows into the results. Right? That's that's the execution people have been describing, but a lot of people would not realize that the amount of preparations before we get to that execution, we know exactly what we do, right? What we're gonna do as well. Uh, which a lot of, like I always relate my philosophy of business with football, right? The 90 minutes that you see that people are playing on this weekend match, it comes down to the Monday to Friday, how they train in the training ground, how they play with each other. So that 90 minutes is basically just a performance of that uh, or a testament of that training quality. Yeah, one of the uh, learning points for you, quite famously, is the fact that you uh, follow Sir Alex Ferguson quite closely and you adopt a lot of um, techniques and trip uh, tips from other industries, not necessarily yourself, like football and sports. Um, can you talk about some of those um, learnings? I mean, what are some of the things that you put into practice within Kasim that, you know, that, that were the results of your years in Inity, with your re result of your failed ventures? Um, just, you know, for the benefit of aspiring entrepreneurs who want to build businesses in e-commerce, who want to regionalize, who want to disrupt, and who want to, you know, solve pain points. Um. So I think building a business really first need to define what you're trying to do, right? Uh, especially, uh, like, I still remember seven years ago when we started the business, how that conversation started within a, a, a cafe in the Manara, Manara Millennium, which is not too far away from here. Um, myself and my co-founder, we were talking about, you know, the, the pains that you see in the market when it comes to selling and buying our car. And we were buying, I was buying my first, uh, car, which is a used Vira, Proton Vira, and you know the 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 the, the number of dealerships that you go to to go for test drive and really try to find a car because of limited inventory. That's number one pain point. Number two pain point is there's no transparency in pricing and car condition because no centralized database, so you wouldn't be able to find out those data. Um, and then 
that comes the experience where you have the haggling, uh, the additional fee uh, that added to it. And the worst part is when you bought a car, it most likely also uh, comes with issues sometimes. And because of no after sale support, it becomes a, a problem, right? That you need to fork up uh, from your own pocket. Um, and equally, when you try to sell your car, it's the same. So we wanted to start a business. Um, and then we tell ask ourselves, right, what is the kind of uh, things is fundamental when it comes to building a really good business that we can continue keep doing it after 10 years, 20 years, and so on. Um, and we identify that firstly, the market need to be huge enough for us to really navigate. We, we need to have an opportunity that can really just keep doing this and it will grow larger and larger and continue to scale from there. And secondly, is this is, this is the kind of uh, service or product that or platform people want to have, want to see you contribute uh, uh, to their daily life or whenever they may have a need. Um, and I think third is you need to have a really good team to start off to build up that foundations and eventually to pursue more and more um, and recruit, of course, uh, uh, new leaders, right? So, and I believe that at the point of time, we have this tree. We know it with the, uh, the experience that I just shared with you. Um, and, and then we start building the business, right? So from a team of five to now, I think we have close to 4,000 people, or if not 4,000 people, um, across like five countries. So um, every single person who come into the business, we talk about the same thing, right? We tell them exactly how we started and why it got us to where we are today and where we are trying to head over. Um, and it's a lot about like relating to football philosophy, right? Like you have a team of 11 players. Um, they all just want to do one thing. Right, win the match. And winning the match means that they will become a champion eventually. But you realize that everyone plays a different role within a match, in a team. Some need to score a goal, some need to save a ball, some need to you know, just mark and tackle someone. Um, and I think to us, it's the same, right? Like We have different uh, responsibility within the team, uh, within the company. Um, it, 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 it's important that we can rely on each other it's important that we can utilize the strength of others and amplify the strengths that we have. And you'd be amazed that when the team is functioning like a wet oil machine, um, how much more growth you can see, how fast things are progressing and moving. Um, and, and we've been always trying to recruit people who share the same mission and put priority on the business side, just like how a team put priority on winning a match. Right, so and I think that's just how we we relate to the, the the football side of things. Yeah, but seven seven years is actually not a long time because um, you know to get to a essentially multi billion ringgit dollar valuation at this pre market valuation, you're already worth more than many bursa companies, right? So one of the pain points that entrepreneurs always cite in Malaysia is the fact there's not enough good people, not enough engineers, not enough designers, not enough UX guys. How did you find these people? Um, especially at a time when maybe Kasim, you know, seven years ago, six years ago, was not, you know, Uber or not Grab or one of the more household names. I remember those days we talked and there was a lot of new players on the scene. Some have disappeared, some have gone under, some have gone sideways, you know. So how, how did you solve the, the skilled personnel point? Um, so two things, right? So uh, firstly, uh, I think... Malaysia has a lot of talent, right? I'm a Malaysian, uh, and you know, I, I didn't really, you know, I dropped out from college, so I didn't really have the kind of experience to, to, to begin with, right? But I realized that Malaysians are very versatile. And what that means is today, if you put a Malaysian or someone into an unknown and start having him to learn new things and all, uh, you realize that the, the way to capture things and really become an expert in that category um, sometimes can be a lot faster, simply because you have, you know different languages, you've been exposed to different culture, um, and the environment allows you to do that. But I think the problem is always about uh, exposure, right? The exposure that you get in uh, Malaysia might not be as much. So one of the, the growth that I saw in myself comes from a form where I started to interact with a lot of people who have done things, seen things, and sometimes you have these people like in Malaysia, and they have a lot of other people also from other uh, markets, right? Like uh, other countries. Um, and the way you can absorb this knowledge is important. And I think that um, within the company, you will always capture that, that learning mentality, right? How do we learn and continue to absorb qualities of uh, good qualities from others and turn it into our own quality um, and, and continue to, to work towards that. So 
Um, I think that's, that's uh, the number one point I try to bring out, right? That we know how to attract people like that. We provide a platform for them to capture those exposure. Uh, we guide them in, you know, turning those into their own quality and eventually contribu contributing back to the team and the business. Um, and that helps a lot, right, obviously. Um, and I think this, the second thing is we've been very focused, right? You mentioned about why there's a, like, there's a lot, lot of names uh, or competitions come and go in the last seven years that we made operations. Um, like we never really think about whether we will reach, unico reach Unicorn in seven years time or maybe like uh, uh, when we're gonna have our exit or whatnot. I think the way we think about the business has always been we have such a large market that we are penetrating. We are still on a single digit market share. Um, we are always trying to focus and see how we can continue to bring this experience to more people, right? So 90 over percent of the people in the market that we are live in today in Southeast Asia still experiencing the very painful process of buying and selling used car. So how do we, you know, expose and make them to experience this process that we are currently championing? Um, that focus has been there since day one, right? Whether it's offering you a solution to sell your car in a hassle-free panel, whether it's offering you a whole new way to buy a car we can deliver to your doorstep, um, and now that we are also providing ancillary support like financing, insurance, and so on, the way we talk to, when we talk about recruitment of new people coming in, when we're talking to partners to become our ecosystem partners in our platform, and even to, you know, how I'm describing to you right now, um, and even actually, to be honest, you look back to the seven years uh, ago, the interview that we did, uh, we emphasized a lot on how we are solving customer pain points. So that never changed. And that's why being focused brings you really far because we consistently been pursuing the same outcome. We want customer to be better off. And how do you translate that into every practice that we have in the business to deliver that? Yeah, I mean, I've got first-hand experience of your platform because I think Less than two weeks ago, I actually sold my car on Carsum. And uh, it, yeah, there, there, are, there are few experiences uh, as pleasant as that compared to, say, 10 years ago. But it, it's, um, it's also a very people business, right? So, so I guess finding people with many different skill sets, whether in, in follow-up calls or for car inspections or you know, valuation, for example, those are quite people-centric uh, skill sets rather than a technology skill set, which those aspects are quite hard to find, la, right, Eric? Um, does that make it a bit more difficult to scale into the region? You've got four countries now, Malaysia included. Does, is that part difficult as you go into the region? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's always difficult, right? Because we are always on a recruitment mode. So you take a look at our LinkedIn and the job openings that you see is like it's easily three digits over there. Um, so we are always looking for better talents and and try to um, increase the bench strength of the team uh, of the company. Um, I think what's more important is. Every business is driven by people, right? The better people you have, the better quality they are, um, it, your business also would eventually upgrade itself. And it comes in a form with the kind of advantages that you own eventually, your defensive mode, right? Your unique strength, your USP. And I think in, in the way we see the business is um, technology plays a huge role to enable a more efficient process. Right, why we can be able to tell you a price within like uh, when you you know come to the platform, just key in your car details. That valuation is is close to accurate to what uh, the price is going to be eventually your transacted price uh, that you get your payment to your bank account. Um, and how do we bring it all the way to the last step so that the whole process seems frictionless to you? Technology plays a role in that, right? Applications in between that we use um, with uh, the back office, our people to the experience that you're getting from the front, whether it's from the website to the app, um, we're constantly improving that experience by understanding uh, the, the whole uh, funnel, how it moves, right? So technology is one thing that we think we have constantly become better because of our understanding of uh, the customers, and that is true to the people that we have. Now, the second thing is the data, right? Data is, is extremely crucial, especially it it, it helps optimize the way our people would you know, uh, give you a call, what kind of uh, content to talk about, and eventually when you come for inspections, how that works, um, how do we reduce the time, um, and how that pricing eventually is something that um, you feel that it's a fair price, but at the same time, we are also able to sell it to the wholesalers, through the auctions, because we are, we are basically building uh, a, a technology that, that bridge between supply and demand. Um, 
And data comes in a form where every single step, it helps us to really understand more insights and analyze, right, before we can turn it into an execution. Uh, and I think uh, coupled with this tech and data, you know, last thing is really the infrastructures that we have built. So I think we recognize that from day one, this business is not uh, a full SaaS company, right? That if you build tech, you use data, you just run a really multi-billion business or become like a very profit generating business, you need a really strong infrastructure support on the logistic perspective, on your uh, um, um, physical centers to inventory hub that you store the cars before it gets moved around between states and city. Um, and we started to really map out the way we should expand. Um, and again, all of this come hand in hand. Like, where should we expand next? You know, data play a role in, in understanding where the demand is, where the supply is. Technology play a role in helping us to really enable us to really get there really quickly by you know sharing similar uh, code base across all countries. As soon as we want to launch a new market, we can re duplicate it and and you know get it live re as quickly as possible. Um, and I think all of this combined is you know why uh, we we are where we are today. Yeah, um, because you're playing uh, as one of the bigger fishes in, in a big pond, ASEAN, right? Um, you've got people like Caro from Singapore, you've got people like OXL from Indonesia. Um, Caro in Singapore, it's a small country, so you know, they, they've got to go out and, and test their metal. OXL is in Indonesia, they've got 250 million people, and they've got that captive um, um, domestic market to play into. So when you are playing in this kind of like um, ocean already, lah, huh? Eric, you know, you're in the Pacific Ocean already, right? Do you look at your competitors? Do you look at each other? Do you do your own thing? Uh, how is the game being played at this level? Yeah, so we, uh, again, you know, I might be repeating myself quite a bit, right? <laughs> uh, we are customer first, always. So when we look at the business, um, what we should be focusing on is how do we think about delivering a better solution or better experience to our customers? Um, and the form of the uh, innovations that we're thinking today uh, internally is to really uh, continue to really go towards the directions that include including starting to create lifetime li lifetime value with our customers, um, and that goes beyond just stopping the relationship when you sell sold a car with us or when you bought a car with us. So it, it goes beyond that, um, and and that is something that we're working on very uh, relentlessly today um, to realize it in the next twelve months, um, and. Um, there is al there's, it's a big market, right? There's always going to be competitions. Um, there's always going to be similar players who try to do the same thing. Um, and I think for us, is we've been able to prove uh, the executions that we have done, the belief that staying focused in building the foundation and continue to leverage that to build further uh, has brought us to a level that we are leading by a really wide margin uh, in terms of market share for all countries that we're in. So that, that itself is something that we are, very, we are very proud of. Um, and again, I think that, was, that is going to be the difference, the, that you would have similar players offering similar products, similar services. Um, there are going to be small differences in between that as a customer you will experience, and those are going to be your moment of truth, right? Uh, that you would choose Carson, but you know, why not others? Yeah, actually I went through those steps as well, and actually competitor B did fall short in some aspects. Um, so is, what I'm getting from you is that you don't really look at your competitors and what they're doing. You focus on the customer and is it as simple as that? You just ebb and flow according to what your customer tells you? So how, how does that work at an operational level? No, I think we look at it very holistically, right? We even look at global peers, how they're doing, how they're moving the metrics, uh, how many cars they list up on the platform, how does it translate into financial results, uh, the turnaround time, uh, what kind of people, deal divisions they set up. We do a lot of analysis on almost everything, so very holistically look at the market and see what would work for us. Um, but it, it still has to come down to one single priority, right? Right. Like, if you're going to do this, is it going to be really to fence off your competitions, or are you going to be really focused on delivering what the customer wants? Um, and again, we have done things where we felt maybe you know this would work if we you know uh, uh, go on the focus of competitor side. Uh, but not towards what customer is, is trying to get. Um, and that usually do only bring you short-term results. It's not a long-term focus. Um, and I think within the business, we have cult been cultivating a, a belief that we need to uphold to what we believe from the very beginning, from the get-go. 
um, and continue to utilize that and, and, and keep going, right? Uh, so we profile the customers more than we profile our competitions. Um, and I think that's the, 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 the key winning point, right? Where why um, we always constantly able to convert more customers with us. So the thing is, I, th I think one of the key reasons why you have a billion dollar val valuation is the fact that investors see you as operating in a region where there's nearly 700 million people, right? But the thing is, ASEAN uh, is not a homogenous uh, sector. It's 13 countries, very different people, very different cultures. It is not like North America, 350 million people, all roughly the same ilk, yeah? Um, how do you navigate that in terms of profiling customers into an expanding market which, is, which are very, very different in makeup and culture and beliefs and, and buying habits and things like that? Yeah, so um, we see Southeast Asia as a really huge market, right? Because if you think about the populations over here, uh, it's easily like 600 or a million of population. Um, and a country like Malaysia, probably you have a lot of uh, cars, um, which the average uh, car ownership per thousand capital is at about maybe three, four hundred. Um, but other countries like uh, Indonesia and Thailand, uh, while they have a lot more population, uh, but they have a lot lesser cars on the road. Uh, and, and there's a lot of two-wheelers uh, uh, that, that still pretty much exist in those markets. Um, a lot of people don't own cars. And if you think about owning a new car, it's actually um, a lot higher because typically, if you think about a car price in this market, including Malaysia, um, is either equivalent to uh, uh, a year salary or maybe two. So it's not a very, it's, it's almost a lifetime purchase, one of those, right? So which makes it very important, right, to really get it right. Um, and so we come in in the anger that we first own that process and we become the one that's able to offer you the best choice, best experience, in, best selections in the market. Um, and then we, we, we start to look at uh, the market dynamics, right, where we have markets like Indonesia and Thailand, including Malaysia, that middle class are rising. Um, a lot more people are upgrading from two-wheelers to four-wheelers, but going a step up straight to new car is usually not possible. So used car become a natural choice. And then you have um, 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 COVID who kind of drive the car ownership appreciations. Uh, more and more people want to have their own prior vehicle. So then naturally this become another driver. Um, and moreover, I think now with COVID, with lockdowns now removed even, um, you see that most people, now, instead of being uh, um, digital savvy, now they become digital first almost in every behavior that they, they, they have, right, when it comes to interacting with things. Um, like earlier, I think the number of shots that we took <laughs> just to, before getting on the stage, you know, some of this how eventually we end up online. I think that already kind of showcased that we, we, we kind of distribute things on a digital first basis and cars included today. Um, and I think that's where we felt that the opportunity is there. Um, that utilizing our strength, uh, our operating playbook, because we are really good at executing what we are doing, we are not just only able to do it one in one country. We are able to replicate that playbook into other countries. Um, and by analyzing and understanding the differences between the, the markets, what actually triggers, what helps, the processes, um, even the procedure, the SOP, um, I think this utilizing the local leader's help, it becomes a lot greater and a lot better. Um, which, which is why eventually yeah, you see that we are tackling the same pain point in all markets, um, but ultimately the success of uh, each market comes from a lot of uh, strong local leaderships that we have built, um, and they, they believe in the same thing, and they want to do the right thing, and that's why you know, they continue to pursue on the same path of uh, success of, with us. Yeah, so you own the process, then you replicate it into different countries, uh, and of course, your data analytics team is very strong, and you've also got a very strong digital um, headline layer, right? Um, what are the intricacies of doing that, though, in terms of the growth markets for you guys, right? Um, regulation, for example, is, is that an issue? Um, wallet size, is that an issue? Um, what are some of the things when it comes to growing the business into the region for you? I think we don't run into generally too much issue so far, right? Because um, unlike a lot of other industry, uh, the, the car industry is not heavily regulated. Um, um, so in, in many ways, we're actually working very closely with the government, uh, uh, different uh, minist ministry to see how we can continue bring digitalizations um, in the car training environment. So used car has always been very traditional and offline. 
Um, and when we talk about digitalizing the process, um, I think it gets a lot of people excited. It gets a lot of people to be more involved and commit into making this process transparent. Um, and those conversation is how it, it started, right? When we first introduced with uh, uh, one of the ministry, uh, another uh, in different markets, right? So we talk about things on how we can innovate and bring innovation using technology. Um, and um, I think oftentimes that turned into really uh, useful information on how we think about building the business. So um, that hasn't really been a really strong challenge, I would say. Um, and in, in, in fact, actually, they, they've been embracing the change uh, in many ways. Um, and I think, uh, you know, down to pocket size or whatnot, right, like how much income uh, everyone would get and whether it would change anything for our business. Um, used car market has always been mo one of those uh, uh, very resistant to recession uh, across the few, you know, downturn that you have seen in the last three or four recessions, right? Uh, and um, I think that's, that's one of those things that we really observed and felt that, you know, by operating in the used car market, um, we are always able to really uh, bring up uh, the, the volume very quickly and capture more market share. Firstly being we are converting the offline. We are delivering a better experience. And secondly is um, actually with more inflation, more recessions, uh, used car become a lot more affordable option for a lot of people. Um, and I think that's you know, in a nutshell, net positive for, for Carson. So your plans, are they very capital intensive? Um, and, you know, in terms of the options to raise the necessary capital, right? It's, it's a very different world now than, you know, maybe even nine months ago. Things have changed very quickly and guided mainly by maybe central bank policies and sentiment and inflation, supply chain issues, you know, this military conflict in the Ukraine. Um, it's a very different world now. And, of course, for you, who is very operational and very on the ground, you now have also the task of trying to raise capital in a very different environment. Can, can you talk through the intricacies of that? Yeah, I think uh, Carsim has always been a, a business that we believe um, we don't need to raise a lot of money, but we raise enough to really get to uh, where we should be. Um, so so I think by, by uh, the amount of a raise of as much as is, is uh, quite a big sum, um, but to us it's not really um, um, a lot of comparing to the growth that we have been producing, right? Um, so uh, we have always been uh, able to deliver good results for a lot of our investors and they're very happy to, to talk about Carson, right, uh, in front of a lot of other people. So I think the trust has always been, has, has been uh, building and becoming a lot stronger among people who are trying to, uh, um, or have an interest rather, to think about investing into Carson. So those conversations naturally become easier because um, when we think about how we're investing back into the business to produce growth, uh, to capture more market share, um, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? We have a, a full blown plan that we uh, um, talk about how we actually allocate those investments into um, delivering the outcome. Um, and I think the fact that people have that, that belief, right? Uh, confidence in our execution, in the team, uh, that becomes another um, um, or easier way for, for them to digest and see if they like to eventually become an investor of Carsem or not. Yeah, so I think at an operating level, at a profitability level, it appears that you've got that reasonably sorted. But then you've also done several rounds of funding and you've got an, on board a bunch of investors who might be looking for you know, an exit plan or some kind of strategic um, you know, uh, next stage, if you like, right? How do you appease the expectations of these investors? You know, because again, I mean, when you look at the capital markets now, um, although operationally Bukalapa in Indonesia seems to be doing well, um, they've got their traction, but their share price has taken a bit of a tumble. You can see the same thing with Grab, um, C Limited, even though they've got majority positions in Shopee and, and Garena, for example, they've taken a tumble. It's a sentiment thing which has gone against tech now. So just in terms of managing expectations, that there's a layer of skill that someone like you in your position have got to deal with as well. So hands-on, yes, but also up above. How do you deal with those issues? Yeah, I think in the, at the end of the day, you can't really control where the market is going, right? So public market can, can uh, at the same time, feel very choppy and all. Um, but I think one thing for us, we are confident with the, uh, the way we deliver results. Uh, which means that um, on the business performance, uh, on month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter, 
we, we continue to really look at that as something would measure where the business health is today. Um, and I think that is something that the, the market wouldn't be able to uh, affect, right? Because uh, affect in a sense where um, you can go out in an environment that uh, market is bad, but as soon as the market turns good, um, your business be one of the first one to shine. So it's the same way that how we think about like why we are able to really rise up very quickly during the COVID times. Um, you just have been building a really good business um, and you identify the right way for them to really see uh, the business right when you amplify it. Um, and when that window of opportunity comes, it becomes the pivoting point, the inflection point for the business. So I think for business performance wise, uh, with the market, how we are moving, uh, um, we have already you know, started that inflection point. We started to see that happening and seeing ourselves capturing more and more uh, market share and, and units sold in the market. Um, I think on the investor side also, we're starting to really get a lot of momentum as well, that the confidence is building um, and people see that we are really doing the right thing. So market would affect eventually maybe uh, certain things and sentiments and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, the one thing they can't change is how you think about the business, whether they are a right team and whether they are um, going to become a much, much bigger company in the next couple of years. So do you think that ASEAN unicorns can ever get to the point of American unicorns? American unicorns, $100 billion valuation is even nothing nowadays, right? And they are operating in a market of 350 million people. ASEAN is 600, 700 million people. It's double. Yes, much less affluence, but one day we'll get there, right? Do you think ASEAN can ever get to 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion dollar valuations? I mean, Tesla is a trillion, well, until recently, over a trillion dollars, right? Apple was nearly three trillion at one stage. Do you think ASEAN unicorns can ever get there? Well, again, nothing is impossible, right? I think looking at Qasim, uh no one would have thought that we would become where we are today, right? Uh, unicorn, uh, one of the largest platform um, in Southeast Asia. Um, I think a lot of, like, I still find it really uh, vividly that, you know, many, many years back when I tell my team that we're going to eventually reach uh, uh, two, three thousand cars a month of unique cars, so, right? They came from the car industry, they were just laughing. <laughs> like, that's just impossible because the biggest is only doing like less than a thousand. How can you actually go so, so high? And we are so much more, we have gone way beyond that already. Um, so then you start to see people saying that actually it's possible, right? Um, and looking at Asian startups, looking at the environment, looking at the, the market size and you start to see also some Asian company or ASEAN companies become a global company, that they are not just operating in Southeast Asia, but they're operating in some of the other markets and finding, finding success as well uh, in new markets. So it's, there's always going to be one or two that become the first that out of the gate and eventually opens up the flow for the rest to follow. Um, and I believe that, you know, that will eventually come. So what's the, where's the growth for Kasim? Because until, I think November was the turning point for, for e-commerce and technology, right? But when C-Limited in its heyday last August, September, it was worth about $180 billion, right? Shopee was in Brazil, growing in Brazil of all places. So that was an example of a model being deployed in a very, very far-flung uh, geography and succeeding as well. And I think their games were in uh, India as well. So can the Kasim model work in South America? Can it work in... I don't know, India, so in, the, in, the, in the Asian subcontinent, can, can it go there? I mean, what do you tell investors to get them really like um, wetted by your you know, promise? Yeah, so on the Carson specific uh, direction, I think we so far has been pretty focused in Southeast Asia, simply because uh, it's a really large market with single digit penetration right now. Uh, there's a lot more room for us to grow and that itself would become um, a, a huge multi-billion business, right? Um, and I'm only talking about on a transaction level. We have not even factored in all the other ancillary that is, you know, run, um, um, empowering the business, right? Like financing, insurance, and, and so on. Uh, each of those can actually create a unicorn in, itself. So um, we always been exploring new markets. And I think the way we see new market is it has to firstly have similar pain points waiting to be solved. Um, and we have the right uh, uh, fundamentals to really come in and, and do that. Um, and we actually have identified a few different markets that we see uh, is something that we can actually uh, uh, launch a custom um, and start scaling there 
um, um, in, 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 and continue doing that, right? To remodel what we have done in Southeast Asia. Um, so the possibility is there. But our focus, I would say, will still remain to be Southeast Asia for now. Yeah, so if you can cast your mind back, Eric, to those days when your businesses in World of Warcraft and uh, the newsletter failed, you didn't want to leave your house because you're depressed and your buddies were you know, driving nice cars and you were like, trying to find a direction, right? And here you are now, um, I think 15 years, it's, it's not a long time in the larger scheme of things. Um, what advice can you give to aspiring entrepreneurs at all stages of their growth path, right? What can you tell them? What, what do they need to know about doing business? Yeah, um, yeah. so I got a pretty interesting uh, uh, starting point, right, with, with my career and also I think uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize is, um, I mean, just to share your story, because my, my sister has like, a, a, I have a nephew, so my sister was the one that scored like straight A's and all, right? So after seeing where I am today, then he basic she basically told uh, the kid, you don't have to study, you just play games every day. You know? <laughs> so which which I feel really pressure now uh, and stressed out that <laughs> this is actually the the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, but you know, I actually s s learned a lot more and I study a lot more after I I I had my first job because. I, I found my passion through my first job, which is, which is Inity, the digital, digital advertising firm. I got a really good boss who provided me a platform, the opportunity to make mistakes and continue to really improve from there. Uh, and I think being really passionate about what you do is the first prerequisite because that turned into the perseverance, that turned into the determination, that turned, in, turned yourself also to be a lot more forward thinking, more ambitious, um, and you start to want more, then you start to thirst for knowledge. Um, you're trying to find a solution to a problem or to an answer that you, you're trying to, uh, to a question that you're trying to have answer to. Without the passion, without that thirst to, to go for it, it's almost impossible to drive that. I think that explains why I didn't perform well in school because I just don't find it um, getting me anywhere. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> again, maybe I say it the wrong way. But again, yeah, I think that is very important. Like knowing what you want and knowing how you're going to pursue that and nonstop, and you can see yourself 10, 20 years later, you're still doing the same thing. And I think that turned into a lot of uh, very positive outcome. What is the passion for? To get to drill down, right? Passion for what? Passion to right industries' inefficiencies, passion for being in control of your destiny and starting your own business, passion for money, passion for maybe doing better than your you know, outperforming sister, elder sibling, for example. What, what defines passion? Um, so one of my, my, my uh, 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 team member in Qasim said very well, right? So he's my chief of staff, Aaron, uh, probably is listening today. Uh, Fulfillment, right? So I think that the, the, the fulfillment is what we all are seeking for. It, it, I think uh, financial freedom could be one of it, right? Being very successful in career is another one. What I feel the, the richest always is about, you know, the people that you build a business together, um, being in the same journey um, and continue to really uh, keep pursuing the same mission, right? So at this point of time, I think Carson is a mission to a lot of people. And I think that is something that I want to continue to drive, right? That this outcome would, or this vision would eventually become a reality. And, and how do we make sure that we can get to that goal? Because when we reach there, you know, everyone would be very satisfying. They will get, uh, they will be happy. They will be successful. Um, they could, you know, drive nice car even and whatnot. But you, you, you find more fulfillment by able to deliver the promise. And I think that's when I feel really uh, happy. Um, and that's the reason why I, was, I'm, I joined Endeavor as well, because of how much uh, fulfillment you could get by being able to share and inspire people, right? Or share your mistakes so that other people don't repeat it. Um, and I think that's, that's how I think about, you know, um, being passionate can actually get you to the, to, to the eventual point that you can pursue that fulfillment. I hope I can uh, say this without um, sounding overly sensitive. But you mentioned your sister many times in the early part of today's interview. And it seems as if that was quite formative for you in terms of lighting the fire 
to want to go and succeed where maybe in, when you're young, you know, your sister was getting straight A's and you were not. And then maybe your friends and your family or your mom and dad were going, oh, you'll never amount to anything and look at your sister. And you know that sibling rivalry can be very, very powerful, right? I think Richard Branson talked about that in his book as well, titled Losing My Virginity. Um, it's a very powerful flame. Um, certain other entrepreneurs talk about how when they were young, they had nothing to eat. They couldn't go overseas to study. So that, those fires burn bright and that lights them for the rest of their business life. Was that what lit yours? In yeah, a way? I, I, now, you, now you talk, I mean, the way you relate it, yes. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I was trying to be competitive and, and get to a point that... Prove them wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you're quite right. You're quite right, yeah. I should, I should become a psychologist. Um, <laughs> I also want to bring up another point. Um, you know, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, he once said famously that that which does not kill you only makes you stronger. So people must encounter hard times. They must have encountered starvation, famine, you know, massive um, resistance before they find their inner, inner strength. You went through that failure multiple times, right? Did that add to the fire, do you think? To want to go and prove people that you can do it and here you are finally, are you doing it? Yeah, I think a lot of people, during, especially during this, the first year of Qasim, um, a lot of people around me would have the, the, um, um, the thoughts of, you know, oh, Eric is starting another company again, trying new stuff. It's, you know, after a year later, he wouldn't be there anymore. Yeah, he would just come back to uh, work for you know, his previous employer, right? So. Um, I think even my my mentor, my ex boss, had had that kind of uh, thinking, right? Because he went back twice, right? Yeah, yeah. So so I was catch up, catching up with him after, and, and he was telling me, "I thought you're gonna come back." <laughs> so I I, don't, I didn't think you would be there, but uh, but yes, I think uh, there's a lot of drive towards um, trying to make things work, um, trying to really from. I have been down to like the the valley of the valley, right? So. It's really nothing much to lose, and to me is how do I continue to pursue, um, you know, the peak um, in my life or with Qasim. But I think I come to realization also that uh, it is, you know, going at the peak. It means also you can drop back up very quickly, right? Um, and I'm I, I taught myself to basically not afraid to be, you know, going all the way down again because it's just a phase. More important is now, if you're going to be down there, right, who is going to be there for you? Is there going to be anyone around you still continue to believe your ability, your capability, and want to be on the same team as you and help you pursue the next phase of your pick? Um, and I think that's, what I, that's how I want to build a business. That's how I want to build a team. Everyone uh, that uh, um, associate with us is the kind of mindset um, and and we, we continue to build that mentality um, everywhere that we go. It's interesting to say that because um, people like Muhammad Ali, the boxer, also has said that it's not how hard you, you get hit, but it's how quickly you get up after you've been hit. And it's true. I mean, when you look at, say, companies like WeWork, remember WeWork had a $35 billion valuation, pre-market, and then, and then all kinds of things happened in a cascading fashion, and then the IPO didn't happen. Uh, no, now they are, but... They went from 35B to nothing, right? And Adam Newman was in the wilderness for a number of years, right? Um, do you look at those experiences and think to yourself, that thing better not happen to me? And if it does, what are we going to do? Because markets are fickle, right? Yeah. So, we, we, I mean, we just adapt to it, right? Um, I think we can also say the same thing when COVID happened the first time, that we would just cut everything loose, cut down expenses, you know, stop growing and just uh, stay afloat. Right, so uh, that's an easy way out to us. So um, we think about how to adapt to the market environment every now and then. Um, and what we tend to do is to map out different scenarios um, so that we can activate one of it in the case of you know this backfire. Um, so so it's not like you know we have one plan, we go for it. If it fails, then everyone just say bye bye. Right. So it's it's really about thinking how, when to activate the next scenario and so on. So. It's, it's a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of thinking behind to it uh, um, before going on an execution path, right? So what I would say is um, we are always adapting to the market environment and especially during down, downturn or during crisis, that's when the opportunity become a lot more obvious. 
the, the improvement for your business and uh, everything else, if you knew it, is going to be a lot more tremendous than during a good market environment. Okay, so I'm glad you mentioned that because right now we don't know what's going on. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, Eric. So I'm sure you've done your scenario planning with your guys. What is your best thinking, your best um, scenario for what's going to happen in Malaysia, say the next six, well, let's just not say Malaysia. Let's say your biggest market. So your one, top one or two markets, right? What's your thinking in terms of that country's direction for the next six to 12 months? Uh, for your Kassam? best guess. For Kassam? For Kassam. for Kassam, in terms of your operating environment. Oh. Yeah, so we, so we, we think we will be doing really, really great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I mean, uh, um, basically, we are set to grow, right? And um, and uh, market is in need of a, a solutions like ours. So it's really about how we able to deliver that promise in last scale that now I deliver it to you. Can I deliver it to a thousand people at the same time? Um, and I think we are, you know, moving towards that, that path right now and amplifying that message so that people realize that when they need this, you know, they will use us naturally. Um, so, and we are building actually a lot more things on top of the platform. So simply by staying focused, we are able to extend the business from just a very transactional relationship to a life, uh, 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 a car ownership journey relationship. So as you own a car, you continue to use our service, whether it's through insurance renewal, financing repayment, um, after sales check, warranty. Um, and I think one thing we like to do at the end of the day is the next time you try to sell, we are able to tell you exactly what your price is at today, right? By just you know, coming to our platform or even logging into the app, your car profile already tells you today your car is worth 20,000. And say, hey, my loan is you know, um, less than that, so I can actually get a positive equity. I can pay a free down payment for me to upgrade to another car, and here's another car for you, All right? So I think just just to give you a glimpse of what we are trying to do, there's going to be a whole new ecosystem that we're trying to create here, um, and that gets us really excited. Yeah. That's really evil, Eric, because I like cars. In fact, I love cars, and um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to sell my cars, and they're trying to get me to buy another car. Um, what's the biggest risk to your business? The not able to execute, yeah. So <laughs> I think we are good at execution, but at the same time, um, we have to continue to really uh, do that right on a very efficient basis. Um, and that, that means that the team that we deploy to do all of these things that I just mentioned has to be able to deliver, right? So if they can't deliver, then it's just really just, even by logging into the app, seeing a price, that price is shit, and that price is, you know, means nothing, right? So, uh, you know, it, or it could mean a really good price to you, but it make a lot of losses, so then it become an even worse business model uh, uh, to begin with, right? So I think the way we think about it is we need to continue to work very efficiently, um, execute very well, and continue to stay focused in terms of what we are uh, um, trying to build with the business. And if we do it right, then the, the, the risk will be mitigated. Okay, last question. Um, what are your bankers telling you in terms of what to do next? Are you... Uh, I mean, what, what is the direction for you the next six months? Where will you be in six months? Well, uh, you know, they are good guys, right, always. Uh, so, so every now and then we, we, we talk and all. Um, I think uh, what they're telling us is a good business model, right? So it will be appreciated by the market. Um, and of course, I think most important thing is whether we can continue to deliver the promise. Um, so I think uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure one day we'll see your your name and your company on the same page on the Financial Times as Elon Musk and uh, Twitter and Tesla. So I look forward to that day as is all of Malaysia uh, sitting here as well as at home. Thank you for your time, Eric. It was a great pleasure chatting. Thank you. Thank you. None have been as accomplished as you.